Hello everybody, my name is Wasaya Lawton and I am a senior at the University of Vermont. Today on the podcast, we are going to be diving into the discussion surrounding affordable housing and development in both Burlington and the state as a whole. Joining me today is Thomas Chittenden, a state senator, a professor at the UVM Grossman School of Business, and has years of experience advising on sustainable growth solutions for the state. Thomas, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm really glad to be here. So to start off, wondering if you could introduce yourself a little, maybe how long you've lived here, um, where you went to school. So I lived in Vermont for my 45 years. Uh, I did go to the University of Vermont for both my undergraduate as well as my master's degree. I studied at the business school. I earned a concentration in management information systems. And after graduating, I did move out to Colorado, where I lived for a couple of years, getting some professional experience at Janus Mutual Funds and Level 3 Communications. Then I came back home to Vermont, uh, got a job at UVM, and while I was working as a uh, as an, uh, in the IT help desk area, I earned my master's degree in the evenings, and I graduated getting my MBA, and then uh, I left UVM, I uh, was working at Competitive Computing for some time, and I went back to the university in 2010 as a lecturer, and I've been there since. Amazing. And is it in the business school at university? Uh, Grossman, yeah. <laughs> How do you like that? Um, just interacting with students and sharing your knowledge. Love the, I love the work. I really do. Uh, what I say, I've worked in private industry and mm-hmm. in academia. What I love about academia is uh, working with students, uh, setting my own schedule, a lot more flexibility. Uh, I will say I went back when we had our second child and I just found that uh, I had been teaching in the evenings, but I, I like teaching because I get to decide when I grade. And besides being in class and office hours, there was a lot of uh, li- flexibility and latitude given to faculty to set their schedules to work around their other family obligations. That, and I just love it when people ask me questions and I know the answer it just feeds my ego that's my standard (laughs) joke no I do like working with students and working at UVM and in the Grossman School of Business Mm -hmm. yeah it's an amazing program there um and I understand that you're also a Vermont State Senator um wondering kind of how long you've been in that position talk a little bit about the role um maybe a little bit of a day in the life So I'm uh, just starting my second term. So I started at my first term right in the middle of the pandemic. I ran in the uh, primary back in 2020. So I I served uh, my first two-year term from 2020 to 2022, uh, really 21 to 23, the way it works out. But um, And uh, that was almost 75% on Zoom. This is my first session that's really in person. And I will say it is uh, night and day. It's completely different. Um, Another thing is uh, I prior to and up until this last March, I was a South Burlington City Councilor for eight years and housing was a major topic of a lot of our local permitting and local zoning issues. uh, So I have that elected experience as well. So working uh, with the Vermont Senate, do you work down in Montpelier most days in person? Good point. (laughs) So yes, uh, when the, set, the legislature is in session, we are a citizen legislature, so we only meet approximately three and a half, four months, uh, really from January until May. I think it's a total of 18 weeks that we budget for. Uh, so from January, there are th- about a little less than three weeks left of, this, left of the session. This is the busiest time when a lot of things are moving very quickly. Uh, in the Senate, where there are 30 senators, every senator serves on two committees, uh, so one in the morning and one in the afternoon. My two committees are Senate Trans transportation, which I served on my first term. And this second term, I'm now the vice chair of Senate transportation. And in the afternoon, I am now on Senate finance. Uh, and so those are my two focus areas. I have other committees that I've been on and boards and commissions that I've been appointed to as a state senator. I'd be happy to speak to some of those, but they don't necessarily intersect the housing topic as much as um, what I do in, in the Senate and also in some of uh, in my city council previous role. Okay. Um, what are the other uh, kind of topics that you're working on? I guess as well to just some of the issues that you know you take interest in and can kind of speak on that you help with. And- so in Senate Transportation, we just passed out this last week, and we'll be presenting it on the floor, the uh, Omnibus Transportation Bill. So every year there's this big transportation bill. It's called the T-Bill, affectionately. Uh, I think it's H-479 this year. 
And uh, that's done, that's, that's where I spent a lot of my time and attention, and uh, there are many aspects to it, but the one that uh, garners the most headlines and interest is we're starting to set up the process to collect fees from electric vehicles. Right now, uh, electric vehicles don't pay anything for gas tax, and our fuel-consuming vehicles pay to uh, with their fuel the gas taxes to pay, plow, and paint our roads. Mm. Uh, and th- those revenues are declining, which is not a bad thing from the perspective of less fuel being mm. consumed. Uh, but we still need to pave, plow, and paint the roads. And so what we are looking at is a fair way to collect some assessment, some amount of money, and different ways for entirely plug-in vehicles, for hybrid plug-in vehicles, as well as uh, from out-of-staters through a three-pronged approach. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing, and then there's a lot more transportation I could talk about, but that's usually of great interest. In Senate finance, uh, we see a variety of topics. And so it is uh, anything that affects the revenues of the state comes through Senate finance. And so one of the benefits of Senate finance is you get to uh, wrestle with and see a, a lot of mm-hmm. topics. Like this week, we've been working on uh, how cell towers are permitted in the state, uh, renewing a, uh, a alternative track for that. We've also been working on sports betting. So Vermont, all of our neighbors now allow online sports betting. Vermont is on track, don't want to jinx it, but it's moving its way through the system. Uh, but we've been looking at the fee structure for allowing and, and recognizing operators of sports betting in Vermont. That's been a big topic. We've been looking at regional dispatch and so on. As for housing, I did get a little bit of press because this is the topic I'm very passionate about. Mm-hmm. Um, I did uh, introduce an amendment to uh, the, the home bill, which I'm very excited. I still support the home bill. My amendment was not successful, and I'd be glad to talk about why. But I ran for this office. <clears throat> I did not run for this office to get rich because Lord knows you don't. <laughs> I did not run for this office to get more sleep because Lord knows I, I don't. Uh, I lose a lot of sleep over this office. I ran for this office, and I'll give you my my sort of pitch my that I always say to people. And it is, there's truth to this. This isn't me just you know politicking here. But I ran because I wanted to see more opportunities for current and future generations of Vermonters to be able to stay here, live here, work here, and thrive here. I've seen in my in my role on the South Burlington City Council and through growing up here, uh, and seeing my three sisters all leave the state, going to areas where there is housing. Where there is jobs and there is opportunity. I just see it being too difficult to build a house or a business in the state of Vermont. And so I, I ran because I did not hear enough of my elected officials, elect, elected representatives advocating for Vermont to grow. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to see it easier to build houses in the state of Vermont so that we can have more Vermonters mm-hmm. and more people appreciate and enjoy and become the next generation of Vermonters. A great segue kind of into the housing problems that are going on in Vermont. Um, and I completely agree. I mean, I grew up in Vermont as well. And um, just in this past few months, have, it's kind of come to my attention, just the same issues that you're seeing too. It's becoming increasingly expensive and a lot more people are moving here and rent prices are going up. I was like talking to my mom the other day. She's like, how much are you paying in Burlington? Like, I didn't pay that when I went there. Um, and it's definitely sparked my interest to like, how can we still build new housing and like build development and grow while also kind of balancing this like small town culture of Vermont. Um, I would love to just get your overview of why you think there kind of is a current housing crisis specifically in Burlington Um, and go back more into like this whole state but right now in Burlington kind of like the Channing County area um, what you believe like are some of the causes of why we're here. (laughs) Uh, it's definitely multifaceted and there's lots mm-hmm. of different pressures and, and factors on it. Uh, I will say if I look at vacancy rates, uh, we have one of the lowest vacancy mm-hmm. rates in the country, uh, which just means there's just not a lot of open available space. If you look at uh, available houses, part of it has been, and you spoke to that in part of your question about the pandemic, a lot of people were interested in moving up here, but these constrict this constricted housing market has been persistent for the last 10 or 15 years, if not longer from the data I've seen from the Vermont Housing Conservation Board and VHFA, Vermont Housing Finance Association, my friend Leslie Black Plumeau does excellent reporting on all of this, and so I usually read a lot of her pieces. As for how we got here, I'd also say that Vermont's not alone. Um, there are many areas that are struggling with this, and there are different solutions to these things. Uh, and the state, the government, be it at the local level or the state level or even the federal level, can't be the only fix. There, there has to be market-based forces because we can't build all the houses that everybody needs. What we do have control over is where my attention, where my lens is focused, which is on regulatory controls that are in place and that have been put in place over time. And those regulations uh, really are at two levels. Uh, there, there's a third level, the federal level, but where the home bill focus 
focus is, is really at the local level, and that's where I and myself, Burlington City Council capacity, uh, at the local level in Vermont, and local municipalities get to set a lot of rules over how land is used. And that's important because as new development or redevelopment occurs, just because somebody wants to put a house there, they're not necessarily going to own it for their entire, for the, for in perpetuity, because people come and go. But that building will still be there. So the towns and municipalities that have oversight over that land have a right to set some conditions as to how it should be built in order to maximize, optimize, and align with community interests as well as the long-term goals, be it from a climate perspective, from an economic perspective, or from a, just a smart growth, bucolic, aesthetic perspective. So that local control is absolutely important, and nobody knows the local community than the local elite elected officials, and those are in Vermont, your select board members or your city councilors. So there's local control, and at the local level uh, on the South Burlington City Council, I've been part of many discussions because South Burlington is right south of Burlington, and it is a, a suburban area that has been experiencing a lot of growth pressures on it from the largest municipality in the state of Vermont, Burlington. And uh, for better or for worse, that comes with growth, comes growing pains. And those growing pains uh, persist or reveal themselves when people with a beautiful view in their backyard are now hearing that somebody wants to put in 100 units with parking and no longer a beautiful view where deer might be trolloping along on snowy days, but instead they see the backyards of people have, people's houses. And that, that creates friction, resistance, and concern. And so the question is, how do you navigate that? How do you constrict and define growth to occur at a pace? Where do you design growth to be? Because if people know when they buy a home that that area is designated for growth, that's a different discussion than when if when growth sort of grows up around people without some some oversight, some intention, some community, some community input, and some planning. Mm-hmm. So that's what happens at the local level, but at the state level, which is uh, where the home bill really takes a two-pronged approach, uh, we also have this thing that's been in place for about 50 years called Act 250. Now, it's important. Act 250 is not a bad thing. Act 250 is uh, de facto uh, land use regulation for the state of Vermont. And it was def- it came into existence when somebody wanted to put a big thing down in Queechee, Vermont, where the local community wasn't ready for it, but there wasn't any, necessarily any zoning or any rules to prevent it from happening. So Act 250 is the backstop. If you want to put something in in Vermont you, and you don't have local zoning, it's out in a rural area, but even if you do have local zoning, and if it meets a certain certain threshold, it triggers a statewide review process, which involves a lot of different um, requirements, different check-ins, different reports. Um, and that's great. And you mentioned affordable housing, and that maybe is another point that really is important to highlight. Why I think there's a housing crunch right now is because there's not enough housing. And so one would argue, if you take in economics, that when supply doesn't meet demand, it drives up prices. And so there is just not enough housing supply. And why there isn't enough housing supply, I would argue, is because we have multiple factors, but one major factor is that we have local constrictions at the local level of zoning restrictions. And then Act 250 has a lot of behavioral modifiers and how it affects the marketplace and driving or not driving, not enabling, not encouraging housing growth. Mm-hmm. And this is where I, I definitely appreciate this attention. So whoever's listening to this, like, this is something that a lot of people don't really realize and know because it only affects individuals, individual Vermonters that own a certain amount of land that are thinking, you know what, I want to put some houses on there. Maybe they're thinking of selling. Maybe they want to build some houses for their family. Maybe they want to just... Uh, extract some uh, some resources and some revenue that maybe they want to make some money as they head into retirement Uh, but there is this rule in act 250 it's been in place for 50 years that um, i'll use me as an example i own four acres in south burlington Mm -hmm. so if you know i've been down dorset street the mill market in delhi i'm right near there and that's where the suburban part of south burlington that's been gradually growing because in the late 90s city sewer and water and this factors a lot into smart planning we put city sewer and water into the ground covering what's called the southeast quadrant that allows for higher density housing because we can talk about what sewer water is, but without city sewer and water, you have to have a larger land spots or land uh, parcels so that you can't get as much density because when you need a a septic field, a septic tank with a leach field for it to dissipate, you just can't get that high density housing, which Mm -hmm. is what we need, which is more housing and smaller, closer concentrated levels to meet our climate goals, as well as to meet the needs of college students wanting to find an apartment somewhere in Burlington. But in the southeast quadrant of South Burlington, um, lots of money, millions of dollars, both federal, state, and municipal dollars, as well as developer dollars, were put in to put sewage pipes that we have plenty of capacity on. Uh, There is more room to put more housing out where I live down here. 
So I am adjacent to city sewer and water. I, as a single landowner with Act 250, can put nine units on my four acres within a five-year time period, within five, if I owned other land parcels, I don't, but if I own other land parcels within a five-mile diameter, I would not trigger Act 250 if I did nine units or less on my property. But if I did a tenth unit within five years, within five miles of this, the paperwork I would have to do to build those units, the nine units versus 10 units, would go from this much to this much. Wow. The point is that paperwork translates to uh, engineering costs, lawyer costs, uh, additional fees, and time and uncertainty. So people, and you can see this throughout the countryside, if you dive drive down Dorset Street sometime, I'll show you all of these nine unit developments of houses that were built because people knew that if they built 14 units or just 10 units, then it would be 10 times as, not 10 times, that's an exaggeration. It would be tens of thousands, that's not an exaggeration, mm -hmm. tens of thousands of dollars of more money just to see if you could build that 10th unit. But with Act 250, the appeals process creates a great deal of uncertainty where things are often derailed, stopped, thwarted, or otherwise drive the expense up more with more time because time is money. Mm -hmm. So my amendment, that the amendment that uh, I had a lot of support, but we wanted to respect the committee process, and that was still alive in the House, which is, again, part the plan to raise awareness over this was to address this housing crisis to to make more housing available to drive down the average cost while also addressing the missing middle so that there's more fluidity in the marketplace mm -hmm. because if people in one house could then move into another house smaller or larger meeting their family needs that creates the flexibility this also gets to the homeless needs we need more housing more roofs for more people to be able to live in them and if we build more houses that will leave our older stock available where we can repurpose them in a variety of creative ways mm -hmm. but my amendment which is still alive, and Laura Sebelia, Representative Sebelia, was doing a phenomenal job today, keeping it alive in the House, would for a three-year period, and that's important, just in the communities in Vermont that have local planning and zoning. That's important. That's about half of the, the land mass in Vermont. South Burlington has local planning and zoning, which means we have rules. Mm -hmm. There are towns that don't have rules. Bolton is in my district. Bolton does not have local planning and zoning. So they this would not affect Bolton, but in South Burlington, Instead of nine units, if somebody down the street with a 30 acre parcel wanted to build up to my proposal was up to 25 units, they wouldn't trigger Act 250. They would just have to go through the local land rules. And that would be for a three year period, which means when those nine unit developments would otherwise, which are gonna come in, which I would argue is not smart growth. It's actually sprawl. It is less use, less efficient use of land because of this arbitrary, I, I've actually asked people that have been around for 50 years, why is it 10 units? And they said, well, nine sounded too little, 11 sounded too much so they went with 10 so it's just this arbitrary number oh. because we have 10 digits on our fingers so my, my my amendment was just to raise that threshold for a three-year period in towns with uh, local planning and zoning so that if the land and this would not affect any of the natural resource protections mm -hmm. on the land parcel my four acres or that 40 acres anything that's protected forests swamps mm -hmm. marshlands those all stand mm -hmm. but instead of being restricted at nine units if you could fit 14 or 17 and you wanted to you could then build more especially in parcels attached to city sewer and water which would be mine mm -hmm. i've talked too much but that's my amendment that i got some press coverage over it's still alive but i wanted to raise, raise awareness because it's that type of little obscure act 250 little threshold mm -hmm. that is constricting the housing market and it has been for the last 50 years mm -hmm. to the point where that's putting pressure on both prices availability and all housing stock across the income spectrum mm -hmm. I'm so glad that you did describe that because, I mean, just in my little bit of research I've been doing, like, that's what I've come to of, like, why aren't we building denser and closer to these economic hubs? Instead, we're pushing, like, single-family homes, and, like, yes, there might be land protected, but, like, it's all spread out and it's fragmented. And I'm like, that, like, it doesn't make sense. That's amazing that you're working on this. Um, what's the name of it again? So that was an amendment to S100. Another aspect of S100 that is still alive, which really intersects your interest area and this topic that is really important to highlight, is duplexing by right. 
So single family housing has some, and I don't know if you know Senator Keisha Rahm Hinsdale, but she is a phenomenal uh, leader on this topic. And so this has been her bill. And she has the color of law as a textbook, as a book that she always references. If you haven't read it, it definitely talks about how housing policies has, has its roots in um, income segregation and sometimes racial segregation. So uh, I can't speak as eloquently to those topics as, as others, but I will say that um, single family uh, housing is a way to keep poor people from living near rich people. And I think that holds us back as a, as a community, as a state, and as a country. Uh, we are better when we know and can walk and can can relate to um, others across the income spectrum so that we see each other as neighbors and not as others. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my point is in S100, currently as is, if it makes it through the house, if you can build a single unit on a parcel in Vermont, you also have by right the ability to build a duplex that automatically doubles the mm -hmm. amount of housing that's available. Another important aspect is in areas like South Burlington where there is city sewer and water, meaning it can handle density. It says if you have an acre of land, then you have the right, not the obligation. Very important distinction because this gets conflated in the arguments. It does not force you to do five units, but if you own an acre of land and you want to put five units there, the city sewer and water can support it and it enables and allows you to do so. Those are at the local level. And that's where South Burlington, well, on the city council, in a 3-2 vote, I was against this. They restricted <clears throat> and parakeets too that are <laughs> for some reason screaming right now. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so at the local level, there has been South Burlington has passed recent land <laughs> recent land development regulations in the last year or two. I was a 3-2 vote where I was uh, three councillors voted to restrict housing in the southeast quadrant to uh, have what's called conservation PUDs. This mm -hmm. is one of the two reasons why I was against it. It is not good land use. Mm -hmm. That right now requires that for a four acre parcel that you have that you can only build like one house. So I'm, I'm getting my numbers off here. Mm -hmm. But the that requires that you conserve like 70% of Virgen's clay. If you know Virgen's clay, you can't eat. It's not prime agricultural soil. It's good for housing and that's what we have in the southeast quadrant and so they have these mandatory conservation PUDs where you're conserving land attached to city sewer and water because it's near a golf course and that's that's not a good planning that's not smart planning and that's why I voted against it mm -hmm. and so uh, what the S100 does is it basically takes away those local local constrictions those the possibility for those local restrictions so that at the individual the most local level of all at the owner's level if they have access land connected to city sewer and water and they want to put five units on an acre and the natural resources allow for it this would enable that mm -hmm. for conservation but conservation where it makes sense yeah and concert on Virgen's clay and parcels next to neighborhoods where they're in South Burlington, just south of Burlington, there's only a certain amount of conservation and we have already conserved a lot of set mm -hmm. of the Southeast Quadrant. Um, I don't have the specific number, but through a variety of acquisitions as also forest blocks that we have protected, we have over, in my humble opinion, we have overprotected the Southeast mm -hmm. Quadrant of South Burlington, which also happens to be the wealthiest district in the great state of Vermont. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like I was driving down there a few weeks ago and I was like, look at all these big new homes that are being built. <laughs> I guess looking at um, just Vermont as a whole and kind of how it has been growing really fast in the past two years. And I mean, even in the past 20 years, I think there's been a lot more growth. Um, do you think that's placed more pressure on affordability in Vermont and kind of maybe we're not stepping up to being able to address the influx of people in the right ways. The, uh, the term I've heard a lot is uh, climate migration. So uh, we're getting uh, immigrants, uh, immigrants so escaping from the, the pavement traps or the heat traps of, of our inner cities and other areas. And uh, to me, I, I want Vermont to be an opening, inclusive and welcoming environment. So I want to find ways to, to house people that want to live here. I, I don't want to slam our doors shut. I don't want to keep us a gated. I don't want us to be a gated community. Uh, and to, to do that, to allow for that, and also just to allow 
I have three kids. I want them all to have the option. They don't have to stay in Vermont, but I don't want them to leave because they can't find housing here. Mm -hmm. um, my best man at my wedding went to school with him at UVM. He uh, went moved to Texas. He got twice the house for half the money. And that's because they have, if you know Texas, they have no zoning. I am not advocating for Vermont to zone uh, because the alternative, the extreme alternative is 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 haphazard. <laughs> Maybe I just offended some Texans out there. Uh, but you can find the really a poor development design that, yeah. that can occur without some community oversight. But that regulation doesn't come out of developers' pockets. Mm -hmm. It goes into the price of our housing. Mm -hmm. And so the more regulation we have and the more that regulation artificially constricts the, the ability to construct the, a need, a mm -hmm. community need, which is housing, that drives prices mm -hmm. up. So it's not just about, and this is where the conversation usually gets conflated to, I'm all for affordable housing, perpetually affordable housing, mm -hmm. but that usually translates into high density, multi-story building. I'm all for that, but I don't want the options in Vermont to be either, you have to be super rich to afford a, afford a McMansion out in the countryside or super poor and have to live in a place without a yard in a downtown area where you don't have all the amenities and the aesthetic views. It's the missing middle that we've been pushing out and that missing middle are duplexes and four quads and townhouses in different areas and our permitting just isn't allowing and enabling those things and that missing middle as well as more perpetually affordable housing. Uh, without it, it's just creating all the pressures the upward price pressures mm -hmm. on a variety of our housing stock. What would you say are some of the best tools to help, you know, Vermont and Burlington to be able to kind of grow more sustainably, address more smart growth growth goals, um, and to kind of support people in all different walks of life, financial situations, um, kind of like if there's just a few top things you'd recommend talk about the big ones but another big area that i've been a strong supporter of and i'm glad there's finally some movement at this local south burlington level there was a statewide movement that uh ceased last year which is uh, rental registries and looking at short-term rentals um i'm gonna lose some support with my next statement but i, I will also say that um, on senate finance i'm very intrigued by h480 uh, which is a bill that will look at how to we have an extremely complicated property tax code when it comes to education funding in Vermont. I can never explain it, and uh, it'll take, it takes like an entire semester to really understand it. But what I want to distill it down to is we have really three classes of properties. Homestead properties, so that's if you're a Vermonter and you, uh, this is my home, and in my taxes I declare it as my homestead, so I get certain co uh, qualifications, okay. and there's income sensitization, and up to 64 to 80% of Vermonters get income sensitization when they declare a homestead. And then there's this whole other class called non-homesteads but in that non-homestead class that includes rental units which are homesteads like multi-story rentals uh apartment complexes those are in that non-homestead so are commercial properties and so are half vacant or very vacant uh vacation homes hmm. what, I, what i'm excited about is i feel that we should charge a variable property tax rate based on the whether or not it's a commercial property whether or not it is a multi-story uh, occupied uh 90% of the year, of, or um, a vacation rental that is only occupied 20% of the year, 10% of the year. Mm -hmm. um, I think we should have a higher taxation rate for um, idle housing stock in order to motivate and incent through tax policy, better utilization. If you are an out-of-stater that comes up to Vermont in the winter for a month, I would like you to incentivize or be incented to rent that out to somebody for the other 11 months mm -hmm. and then maybe have them go to a hotel for that month uh, that you are and have the math work out so that we have more houses, more roofs for people to work. Uh, to people to live in. So I think we, through t uh, rental policy, uh, through, through both tax policy as well as rental registries, which is an aspect of this, is registering, tracking, and measuring um, who's living where and paying what. Um, and, for, and that can also tie into our climate goals by looking at the energy efficiencies of our rental stock. Uh, I see a lot of... <clears throat> a lot of benefit and getting a handle over our short-term and long-term and other rental stock. Uh, Peter Drucker is a management scientist. I always uh, quote in my, uh, my management classes in the Grossman School of Business that you can't improve what you don't measure. And right now, Vermont is not measuring what we're, what we're renting, what's being rented. Huh. So I'd like to start measuring that.
That's super interesting. I did not know that. Um, and Burlington, so Burlington does great job. So Burlington okay. does have a rental registry, but, uh, not. but South Burlington does not. Essex does not. So a statewide rental registry mm, was okay. proposed. Uh, that's where it didn't go any further. South Burlington is on track because we're now the second largest city in the state, and uh, they are the city council is very likely to implement a rental registry in the next two years. Sorry, okay. you were saying something. No, no, yeah. Um, you're saying about like taxing kind of these different rental properties at different rates. So right now is are these rental like commercial rentals? vacation homes all tax at the same rate right now same non-homestead tax rate but there is some variations for commercial properties they can have property valuations based on uh, projected income of the property and there are these things like rental rebates but that's uh, not that's undersubscribed and for out-of-state vermonters or out-of-staters that don't do their taxes here in vermont they're not getting those rental registries so h480 is i'm very excited about it because it's what i think we need to do we need to better under what's called the grand list uh, mm-hmm. the list of properties in the state of vermont that's often managed at the local level h480 proposes to manage it more at a state mm-hmm. consistent level with additional variables to track what characteristics there are of that property so that we can have better levers mm-hmm. to use tax policy to drive our housing and climate objectives mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, too, if you're looking at places like, you know, Stowe, Killington, like the places that do end up bringing a lot of kind of economic help into Vermont, people like buying second homes there and then renting them out and visiting, like, it's one of the biggest drivers, I think, of our economy, too. And like, it's really important to kind of use that. Um, The last big thing I want to talk about was the... um, Actually, two more big things. But the first one was the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Um, personally, I just have a big interest in this of the contention between how can we grow while also maintaining kind of the small small town charm um, and kind of the open natural land of Vermont, um, but still address the affordable housing problems. And I just feel like some of the programs they have, you know, like funding for mobile homes, manufactured homes, different sort of like AUDs, all that kind of stuff, while also like investing in land trusts and all that. I just think like the work they're doing just has a lot of potential. Um, I'm wondering your thoughts on it, kind of how you've worked, if you've worked with them in the past at all, um, and maybe also what your personal stance is on kind of how we can balance those goals as well. Uh, so I, I don't have a lot of first-hand experience with the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, but I'll say this, the uh, housing advocates I know of speak extremely highly of the organization, and they have a, a impeccable reputation uh, in what they try to accomplish in balancing these dual goals of conserving where we should conserve and, and fostering and encouraging smart housing growth where it also needs to occur. So uh, what I will say, uh, from a finance perspective, what has come up recently and what I've heard of even before I joined the Senate is uh, since the nine, late 90s, we've had... Uh, our property transfer tax so when somebody sells a property there's a, a fee and half of it by statute is supposed to go to the vermont housing conservation board but i hear that all but for the first two years uh, the General Assembly has um, not withstood uh, that uh, statute. If you know that term, not withstood, it basically says we're going to ignore that rule mm-hmm. for this budgetary cycle, which means we, um, some would argue, shortchanged um, the Vermont Housing Conservation Board. That was before my time, but I will say in my two years here, I hear with all the federal monies, we've made good on some shortfalls that we've had in years past. And so there is a renewed interest to fully fund the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, and that's a call that as I've, it's been explained to me from advocates, I fully support half of the money that we collect when somebody sells a house from the property transfer tax should go to the housing conservation board so that we're growing smart and we're conserving smart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess too, just to follow up of that. So kind of when you're combining the people that maybe are opposed to development, um, I guess like the not in my backyard, <laughs> um, and also while needing to grow and address the affordable housing, um, what would you say is like just one or two sentences of like how we can come together as like a state community um, to kind of compromise, um, still grow, but also um, conserve? (laughs) Sorry, that was a roundabout question. question. 
One thing I think that we could do better in Vermont, and uh, this is no slight on current operators, uh, we just have a, a very shire-based approach to governance, uh, meaning each town and municipality has about all the say. You go to other states, especially out west and even down south, there's a lot stronger county-based governance. What I would say, county-based governance, if we start to shift to or at least start thinking more regionally, I think we can better achieve these goals. Um, I, I see Burlington, using these imaginary lines drawn before the automobile age, those people just living on that side of this imaginary line are, are those people. I, I didn't mean to say that derogatory, but I'm saying Burlingtonians that live on that, uh, that side of the line uh, are looking to replace the Memorial Auditorium. And they're going to have to burden, bear that burden for that huge project with just what they're already taxed out. Mm -hmm. But I grew up in South Burlington in Vermont, and every concert I went to growing up was at Memorial Auditorium. So why am I not contributing to the revitalization of that asset and but to make that happen in Vermont we need some sort of more regional taxation or governance perspective at a county for the countywide mm -hmm. angle uh, and the same thing could be thought of for housing if we started to look at the county um, South Burlington has done its fair share and I don't know if that came across earlier on but South Burlington has grown a lot mm -hmm. over the last 20 30 years if you look at our population growth we have allowed for the housing that this this region has need I would say there's this um, growth exhaustion, mm -hmm. um, where this this community just feels like they have grown so much, they, they, they want to slow it, stall it, or at least just get it to be at pace with what the other communities are. Uh, I feel like South Burlington might be more receptive to growth if all the neighboring communities were also helping us fund a recreation center or our mm -hmm. ice rink or the other things that come with that growth. Mm -hmm. And that's not currently happening. So one thing I think systemically that could help Vermont is if we start looking beyond these uh, municipal boundaries and it's Instead, look more regionally around population centers and workplace centers and where people are just naturally living, especially post automobile age. Mm -hmm. um, I, I not that I wanted the automobile or to be automobile centric, but a lot of that has enabled mm -hmm. the growth patterns that we've seen over the last 60 to 80 years that we're kind of struggling with right now. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think like just it's natural, I think, to kind of struggle with growth if you are being faced with it really quickly um, and just... Like, I don't know, if change is happening really fast around you, like, that's tough. <laughs> um, and just seeing, I mean, me personally, too, I mean, I'm from Middlebury, and, like, I've even seen it start to grow, and, like, I think it's so good, and we need that, but at the same time, it's like, oh, I don't want anything to change. I think that's, like, a natural human thing. <laughs> um, and, yeah, definitely South Burlington has, I mean, you look at, like, um, Shelburne Road and, like, all there, um, the highway going through definitely has a lot um yeah that's really interesting um awesome the last main topic i wanted to cover was just i think we had talked about it right in the very beginning of the home um the home bill yes the home bill <laughs> um going i don't think we had talked in depth about kind of what it is um so i wonder if we could quickly explain that a little bit <laughs> sure um there is a lot in this bill, and it's what's called an omnibus bill. And so uh, to be uh, exhaustive, uh, it would take probably an hour. <laughs> and uh, the floor speech for this, I think, was actually an hour and 20 minutes. So um, I think we, we touched upon some of the key things already, which is the Act 250. There are some Act 250 reforms in there, which do allow that. 2555 uh, in very specific areas or downtown centers or growth areas or neighborhood designation areas, and the, which only represents about 0.5% of the entire land mass. Mm -hmm. And the other major issue, uh, topics that we did talk about that is in the home bill is that duplexing by right, as well as when there's city and sewer, um, allowing it for a it allowing for not requiring five units. Other than that, there is a couple of new positions to help advocate on housing. I don't have it in front of me and I'm mm -hmm. probably gonna miss some things, but it uh, does a lot of different things. Those are just the, the two big ones that are getting the most attention and that, that's why I spoke to them. Yeah, okay, awesome. Well, those are most of my questions. Um, I've learned so much too and I'm just really excited about all of this and just being involved in kind of the local community and like learning more about what's going on. Um, is there any other kind of programs or big ideas that you don't think we touched on that would be important, um, for this topic? 
I don't know if I did justice to the topic of uh, rental registry or a statewide rental registry and the, the benefits of that. I know there has been some efforts again to revive at this session, but I, I hear those are, are hitting some opposition. Um, so I think that would be worth looking into uh, uh, short term rentals, Airbnbs. Those two are taking houses off of the, uh, the rental market. And so aligning our tax policies and our registration practices so that hey, we know what's happening and that they're conforming to all the safety standards can do some to put those maybe back into a longer term rental. Uh, where people see more costs associated to shorter term rentals, which uh, longer term rentals will better meet the college student need in the Chittenden County area. Um, so I, I would think that's worth more attention than I, I gave it or justice. Mm-hmm. And my last two final questions is what is your favorite part um, about either being a senator or kind of teaching at UVM? Just what's your favorite part in these roles? Um, and then maybe what's the most challenging things that you faced? <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is going to sound like uh, silly, but no, these are these types of things are the favorite part. Uh, I get invited to like go talk to the Boy Scouts, and when I get invited to uh, other events and meetings, and just hearing from people, I love hearing from people what they care about, and then taking it into my service. Um, I will say this: the the grind of the legislature. They say it's a, a, you, nobody wants to see how the sausage is made. It, actually, working in the legislature, sitting around a committee table for literally hours and hours on end to, to talk through very mundane, very specific language can be a grind, uh, but it's what I signed up for. And it's what it takes to get policy and drive uh, policy to align with community interests and our, our priorities as a, as a state and, com- and area. So getting out there and talking to people is, is one of my best and my favorite parts of it. The legislative part is, is what you sign up for to have an impact on the community that I care about is very meaningful. It just can be a grind. <laughs> long hours <laughs> but it's nice to, like the state house is really nice well thank you so much for talking for a little bit sorry we went over but just so much to cover <laughs> thanks for awesome. all your attention on this important topic so yeah. the only way to address the housing crisis is to Talk address the housing it. crisis and that's done through things like what you're doing so mm-hmm. thanks for your time on this yeah absolutely well thank you so much have a great rest of the day <laughs> bye